And um, yeah, the next session or our first session will be hosted, co-hosted uh, from Dr. Madura Panze and me. Uh, Madura, she is also from Pune and um, she made her master at the University of Bremen in biochemistry. Welcome, Madura. And um, yeah, the topic of our first session is sanitation. And yes, to approach to that topic, I think you only have to mention one figure. 1,500 children are die dying each day due to infectious diseases um, by contaminated wastewater. I think there's no other thing which can't describe better why there is such an important need to have but better sanitation systems and not only for a small, small part of the global population. I think it, more than two thirds of the uh, global population are affected by bad sanitation systems. And so far, sanitation is a major, major topic of the sustainable development goals. And we are very happy that we have two speakers to that section here and that session. And first of all, I would like to welcome Dr. Dayanan Panze from India. He is from Pune and he's director of a civil society organization called Ecosan Services. And he is also the Gen secretary general of the Indian Water Works Association. Very warm welcome to Dr. Dayanan Panze. The floor is to you. And please start with your presentation. You can share your screen. Thank you. Can I share the screen? Can I share the screen? Yes, please, please go ahead and yeah, share the so, screen. Sorry, I was switched off, muted. So you can Hello? do it just, yeah, um, just uh, switch the button here at the, at the bottom of the screen. Hmm? Yes, it works. Yeah, I hope it is visible. Yes, at least we see a sc screen which is from you, but we don't see a presentation yet. Can you see it? Yeah, a screen, but no presentation yet. <laughs> at least on my screen. Can you see now? Not yet. Ah, ah no. Coming. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good morning to you all and good afternoon to all uh, those who are from India and uh, this part of the world. While congratulating uh, Alumni Association of Bremen University and uh, uh, head office and India chapter, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for giving this opportunity to talk on this uh, very important subject, uh, which is always close to my heart. And uh, thank you for organizing this conference uh, on a very important topic, uh, exploring the ways to sustainability. And uh, yeah, definitely I would like to share some of my experiences, which I learned for last 15 years while working in this sector. Uh, along with the German organizations. So thanks to Christoph and Dr. Madura for uh, giving me this uh, uh, opportunity to talk to you. Yeah. Um, uh, Diane, and one, one question in between, is there any chance that you can um, um, switch to the presentation modus in your um, presentation mode in your PowerPoint? Then it's, yes, exactly. Okay. Sorry. It's much better. Okay, no worries. Thanks a lot. So, uh, the topic uh, I will be uh, deliberating today is on the ecological sanitation, uh, popularly known as ECOSAN, uh, which is uh, a, rather a philosophy. It's an alternative sanitation philosophy, and then not that always people think that it is a technology. It is based on the holistic view of material flow cycles, which we will be discussing later on. And uh, unlike the conventional sanitation, which is the end of the pipe technology, 
and uh, uh, always it is thought that it is fit it and forget it kind of uh, philosophy. Ecosan is uh, tailor made uh, uh, to suit to the local needs and it is always customized. And Ecosan considers the waste as a resource uh, that is waste to wealth and uh, not as the disposal part of it. So that is how uh, this is a cross sectoral approach uh, towards sanitation. The need of the ecological sanitation was much more focused uh, during 2000, uh, year uh, 2000, by many organizations who thought uh, while giving a deeper view to the uh, developed countries' uh, sanitation situation, that if we have to achieve these MDGs, Millennium Development Goals, which were until uh, 2015, and now it's sold also for a Sustainable Development Goal, that we need a new paradigm shift to look towards the sanitation. Since ECOSAN uh, is a holistic approach to sanitation and water management, uh, many organizations thought that uh, the sanitation systems are being developed in the developing countries. So why not focus uh, the countries like India and China and uh, other uh, developing countries where sanitation is being uh, implemented and sewerage systems are also being newly constructed. Since Ecosan considers the human excreta as a valuable resource, reusable resource, uh, it is always considered as a sustainable sanitation system. And uh, as compared to the uh, conventional system, which is linear, expensive, and energy intensive. And it is regarded as end of the pipe technology. The goals of the ecological sanitations are uh, first and foremost is the water saving, uh, since there is a scarcity of this precious water resource in not only in India, but many countries. So uh, Ecosan aims for a saving of water, then reducing in the cost of fertilizer. Day by day, the population is increasing and then food demand is also increasing. And to increase for the increased food demand, there is a continuous stress on the chemical fertilizers. So Ecosan focuses on reducing the fertilizer cost, how that we will be discussing later on. And uh, in addition to that, uh, there is always obvious energy saving. Uh, once we save the uh, fresh water, which is used for flushing, uh, flushing of the toilets, uh, the, uh, the saving is happening and then energy saving is happening. And the energy situation as such is very critical. And also in the today's context, uh, it adds to the global warming because most of the energy production is coming from the coal. Uh, at least in this part of the world. So this energy saving also gives, gives rise to uh, reducing in the global warming effect. Another goal of the ECOSAN is uh, besides reducing the health risk uh, uh, associated with the uh, uh, non-compliance of the sanitation uh, facilities, which leads to the contamination of water, the, uh, that it prevents the pollution of surface as well as groundwater. Uh, one can see that uh, the, if the uh, conventional uh, sanitation and sewerage system, if the uh, what collected sewerage is not treated, it is left out into the nature and it contaminates the surface as well as groundwater. But Ecosan, it uh, collects the uh, waste at source and that is how then it, it is successful in preventing the pollution of the water. Then it also pre uh, pre uh, prevents the degradation of soil fertility. Since we do not use the chemical fertilizer, uh, the soil fertility remains good and uh, uh, fertility, uh, increasing of fertility gives more uh, income for the food production. And also it optimizes use of the nutrients. Thus in the nutshell, ecological sanitation is a sustainable alternative uh, since it closes the loop between the sanitation and agricultural what we take from nature, we give it back to the nature. And in this process, the reduction in the or destruction of the pathogens happens uh, due to the treatment and the whole uh, material cycle will look like this. As said earlier, uh, Ecosan uh, deals with the separation of different flow streams, uh, a human being produced
it seems that the line is bad in a moment. Yes, it looks like that. Um, I'm just trying to coordinate uh, with his colleagues to see what's happening. Mm -hmm. um. Okay, one second. Yeah, probably uh, they lost the connection. Okay, <clears throat> that's real life. <laughs> ah, he's yes, back he's again. Back. He's back. Yeah. Yeah. He's back. Yeah. Diane, and sh shall I perhaps share your presentation, and then it might be easier. Hmm? Yes, I will do that. I. I. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can fine. you see it? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Sorry for this technical uh, problem. Yeah. So I was saying that these different flow streams are there. Uh, first is urine, that is yellow water. Second is feces, the brown water. Third is gray water. And then in addition to that, rain water. So normally uh, urine is uh, very simple to treat, uh, a simple hygienization for uh, four to six weeks uh, are required. And that's it, it's it is ready for use as a fertilizer. It can be used in the liquid form or the dry state also. For the dry fertilizer, we need to have further processing, uh, but that is a bit expensive. Then for feces, uh, we need some nature-based solution. Uh, I think Dr. Alex will be uh, talking more on that. So I will not uh, focus on that um, just now. So it is anaerobic digestion, drying, composting, mixing with organic uh, solid waste, etc. And then utilization is biogas, uh, as well as soil improvement, soil nourishment and conditioners. The most uh, contribution for the wastewater comes from gray water, that is through showers and washing uh, and etc. So that can be also simply treated with the help of constructed wetlands, horizontal flow constructed wetland or vertical flow constructed wetlands, waste stabilization ponds or biological treatment or uh, high-end high -end solution will be the membrane technologies. And again, utilization uh, as a resource, uh, it will be for irrigation or groundwater recharge or direct uh, reuse. Rainwater uh, through simple filtration, biological treatment, and it also gives uh, for uh, groundwater recharge. This, thus, if we separate this at source, uh, we deal this uh, simple problem with a simple treatment. Otherwise, what is happening normally is that the urine and feces is produced uh, separately or uh, discharged by the human body uh, separately. We tend to uh, collect it together and a simple problem becomes a complicated problem. This is uh, how the ECOSAN uh, feels, uh, feels that we need to have a different uh, approach to it. And that is why it is a uh, holistic view and uh, philosophy. So possible ecological sanitation solutions could be uh, first and foremost is urine diversion, uh, dehydration toilet, that is treatment on site. Uh, it can be good for single households or smaller schools or community toilets with limited number of users. Second is biogas sanitation based treatment systems. Uh, it is good for farms, again for schools, public toilets, hotels, rural or peri-urban settlements. Third is biogas sanitation offsite, where the uh, vacuum trucks, they do collect the wastes from the toilets uh, connected to, to uh, public toilet systems or urban settlements or even densely populated areas. And then it is brought to uh, offsite treatment system uh, where the uh, treatment happens uh, with the different treatment systems. And it is again further reused for uh, uh, the uses for agricultural and other things. The high end solution could be vacuum systems, which is giving uh, very good results in terms of saving of water. Uh, we all know that these vacuum toilets are uh, installed on uh, aeroplanes and ships and it uses minimum amount of water, hardly about a liter or two for a flushes, flushing of the waste as compared to 10 to 15 liters, which we uh, normally use for the uh, uh, 
normal flushing systems. So uh, we were so much fond of this subject and then uh, got attracted towards this philosophy that when we started our organization, we kept the name of the organization as Ecosan Services Foundation. As said by Christoph, uh, we are a civil society or not for, pro not for profit uh, NGO established in 2006 uh, with a strong support from SICON International. And uh, a lot of encouragement we received from uh, GTZ, now called as GIZ, German Technological Transfer, Germany. Uh, in 2006, uh, when we started, uh, there was uh, many other organizations who had focused on India to promote ecological sanitation. We had a small core team and uh, we strongly believe in network structure with experts from all over India as well as from other world. And uh, there is a loose network which is called as Innovative Ecological Sanitation Network of India. And these are the constituent organizations uh, which were there since beginning. Kalyan University, GTZ, Networking University from Netherlands, Indian Waterworks Association, TTZ from Bremenhaven. So these organizations have been there for last 15 years and they are promoting sustainable sanitation practices. So we normally uh, offer capacity building, consulting, uh, R&D, and uh, project implementations under corporate social responsibilities through several partners. And uh, this uh, under CSR, we do a lot of work in school sanitation, mainly focusing on sustainable sanitation and water management practices. So very briefly about our journey. Since incubation in 2006, uh, we have been working in many areas and then developed many projects, uh, DTS, that is uh, decentralized treatment systems uh, at uh, schools as well as at uh, resorts. Seems again some technical problems yes yes but i hope he resumes soon can you see it yeah yes. back again welcome <laughs> Yeah, and the uh, Guts for Change project. Uh, so uh, moving on further, uh, we have been working with uh, other universities from Europe, that is University of Barcelona from Spain, Boku University from Vienna, then several other organizations from uh, uh, Europe and other countries. So uh, uh, we continued our journey uh, towards the promotion of ec ecological sanitation and sustainable sanitation practices. And one of the prominent uh, development happened in 2008 when uh, GIZ uh, along with Stockholm Environmental Institute established uh, one network, which is a worldwide network, which is called as Susana Sustainable Sanitation Alliance that was established in the uh, year of uh, international year of sanitation 2008 so uh, some of the examples of the ecological sanitation solutions implemented by esf uh, i am just giving you some of the prototypes it is a typical uh, inside view of the uh, urine divergent dehydration toilet it has uh, two uh, pans, uh, these are the squatting pans, uh, but we have the uh, uh, Western commode pans as well. So these squatting pans have two holes. You can see it, one is for urine and another big hole is for uh, feces. And third is for anal cleansing. So here urine is separated, collect, uh, collected separately. The fecal matter is collected separately. Uh, the Each pan is used for six months and then it is closed for further six months. And after next six months, the first uh, uh, vault is opened and the fecal matter, which is completely dried, it is used, uh, it is ready for use as a soil conditioner. 
and urine as said earlier it can be used after 4 to 6 weeks of uh, sterilization some of the uh, constructed uh, uddts uh, near to pune then second is the uh, waterless urinals these waterless urinals are excellent examples to save the water normally uh, each urinal if it is uh, frequented uh, very uh, very high then the water use is also very high you know, on a yearly basis one urinal normally uh, consumes about couple of 100000 liters of water but then if waterless urinals are deployed then this this comes down to less than 50000 liters so these were the earlier were the uh, examples from uh, europe but now you can see the uh, one of the uh, waterless urinal or water saving urinal which was developed in india by one of the company in india in ahmedabad you can see uh, just below this red tape there is one cartridge about 4 to 6 inch height and that uh, comprises of a latex membrane inside and that uh, prevents the foul odor of the urine which is normally there so this is very uh, least expensive it's about 5 uh, euros or so so this is how uh, these are the uh, water saving uh, gadgets allows to collect the urine on a concentrated form so one will ask why recycle urine and fecal matter so this chart gives uh, the some of the statistics this nitrogen phosphorus and potassium which is available from the urine and uh, fecal matter uh, normally it is about 2.7 kg of nitrogen 0.4 kg of phosphorus and 1.5 kg of potassium is available uh, from the uh, treated urine as well as treated fecal matter behind every person also the statistics says that if we try to use the uh, total uh, nutritional values of this npk then this could be sufficient for a human beings uh, needs uh, to produce the uh, uh, overall the food grains and all so this is how the uh, agricultural reuse is happening uh, these are the uh, direct injections uh, uh, machines uh, this is from norway some of other countries in africa also they are using it for uh, vegetable cultivations for irrigation and urban ag agricultural as well uh, the farmers here uh, are uh, uh, deployed uh, urine application uh, in on the fields they use it for different uh, crops uh, they uh, use it for uh, sugar cane you can notice the difference here on the left side no urine on the right side uh, with the urine and the uh, sugar cane uh, cultivated with the support of urine it is higher that by 2 or 3 feet at least so this is how the yield is much more when we use uh, the uh, diluted urine who has come up with excellent standards how to use the urine uh, it has got uh, standards of dilution 1s to 3 1s to 5 1s to 10 and all and which crops can take up the best dilution of the urine it is also good for uh, flower cultivation as well as uh, other crops uh, which are normally uh, produced in and around uh, pune city third is the grey water uh, utilization uh, a simple hand wash uh, basin can be retrofitted for collection of the grey water and then this grey water is further uh, brought to the vertical gardens uh, and then it can be good for the landscaping as well as it can be used as a ornamental uh, design for the high rise building there are many such examples uh, world over as well fourth is waste water recycle solutions that is uh, sewage cure which is developed uh, in house and then it is good for colleges institutes hostels or resorts or even for the uh, marriage halls and all so, and then uh, treated water is used for toilet flushing and land application and other constructional activities like uh, concrete mixing and all this is how uh, the uh, anaerobic digested systems looks like uh, it is completely underneath uh, it is below the uh, road so no area utilization is happening uh, in the uh, densely populated urban uh, cities 
and also the constructed wetlands gives a good uh, landscaping uh, eyesight. Uh, you can see on the right side uh, the constructed wetlands uh, with the use of uh, Kana Indica. They can also add to the uh, beauty of the overall uh, uh, institution institutional areas. Some of the photographs of the uh, systems which were developed by uh, Ecosan. So mobilization has been happening uh, in India. And as said earlier, uh, many organizations uh, like Stockholm Environmental Institute, West Netherlands, uh, German GIZ, the Norwegian University of Life Sciences, and so on and so forth. They were, we all were trying to promote uh, these uh, philo different philosophy. We promoted it to the policymakers because it is obvious that once it is understood by the policymakers, they will try to impart this to the local masses. Then to the technologies, because we need good engineers and technologies to promote these different solutions. Then mass awareness also took place through media. Then promotion also took place for the NGOs who are ground to the earth and then on the grassroots level, they do contact uh, institutes to the children and then to the beneficiaries. So this has been happening since last 15 odd years. And uh, yeah, I, I must say here that uh, sometime in 2011-12, GIZ was very uh, happy to announce that this ECOSAN program in India has been very successful. And then now it can be left to the uh, local organizations and GIZ uh, tried to withdraw. And then now it is only supporting with the Susanna networking, Sustainable Sanitation Alliance networking. So uh, this Indian Waterworks Association is also one of the permanent uh, organization who supported uh, promotion of ecological sanitation in India. It's a foremost organization for the water sector professionals uh, established in 1968 and there are 34 centers and there are 12,000 members throughout India. It also conducted several workshops on ECOSAN to promote the philosophy and also promote the technology. And a grand successful conference also took place, international conference way back in 2006. So the knowledge dissemination is a continuous affair for the IWWA. And it also has excellent networking with International Water Association, American Water Works Association, Australian Water Association, Global Water Partnership, and Saugun, as well as German Water Partnership also very recently added, that is last year. And then I said that it's a continuous effort we need to have uh, for sustainable uh, achievements. And then these lessons learned uh, for last 10, 10, 15 years is that continuity of action is very much essential for deriving sustainable outcomes. And network is very much essential. And uh, I'm very happy today that uh, another network uh, event is happening. And then um, through this Bremen Alumni Association, we will be having more and more, uh, I would say the uh, ambassadors or the volunteers, what you can say, to promote the sustainability of the action uh, throughout India on different subjects, not only sanitation, but mobility as well as the transportation. And uh, at the end, I am really sincerely thankful to all these German organizations, GIZ, TTZ, BOLDA, German toilet organizations, for wholeheartedly supporting the uh, cause of action uh, on a continuous basis. And that is how uh, I can definitely say that the India also had a Swat Bharat mission, which began in 2014-15. And it saw that earlier the toilet coverage was only about 32%. Now it is almost 95% plus. So all these continuous efforts have given the results. And now it's our duty or responsibility to see, to see that the uh, sustainable uh, results are achieved so that we can achieve the sustainable development goals. With this again, thank, thank you all for patient listening. And I'm very much looking forward for Alimane Association for uh, working together. Thank you very much. 
Yeah, great. Thank you very much, uh, Diane. That was um, a very interesting introduction to the impressive work of your association. And um, perhaps you can stop sharing your screen so that we can uh, see all of us again. And um, thanks for that. And um, yeah, for me personally, it was interesting to see that uh, beyond Border and GIZ, you had already some connections to an institute in Bremerhaven, which also belongs to the federal state of Bremen. And I hope um, that kind of connection can be continued or followed up in future. And um, yeah, are there any immediate questions to Diana? I don't see any hands raising. So perhaps one little question or short question to you um, regarding the urine di uh, diversion toilets. Um, are there any regulations in India restricting that or somehow controlling or monitoring that? No, there are no restrictions or there is uh, controlling by way of, uh, we have uh, several states pollution control boards which normally monitors the uh, treatment aspects of the treatment plants but then uh, the uh, urine reuse uh, it's not controlled or it is not regulated as well uh, however the uh, responsibility of the users is to see that it is uh, treated properly or it is hygienized properly before using it and uh, I must add here that uh, as of today, there are about 40,000 plus uh, urine diversion dehydration toilets already throughout India. However, uh, these UDDTs are good for the uh, rural context where use can be made uh, in the agricultural side of it. And laser, uh, laser use uh, is happening in the urban context. So that is how the population is 40,000 plus is not big compared to uh, Indian population. But however, people have understood the value of it. And yes, they are using it uh, sensibly. Okay, thanks. And there's a question from Rolf Herzog. Please go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I've seen the picture of the vertical gardens. Um, and I'm working in a network of uh, city um, or of urban gardening and uh, city rural um, food systems. Uh, do you have any link to these vertical gardens, producer? Yeah, I can share you one of the article on this. Uh, so that will give you all the details. So uh, you can make use of it. Thank if you. That helps. Uh, great. First network effort <laughs> already. Um, so yes. there's another question from Tulasi. Can you see that in the chat? It's, is there any yeah, regulation it's, it's, restricting it's, it's, the reuse of sludge utilization, utilization after ad technologies and FSM treatment, FSM is fecal sludge management? No, 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 no regulation. As said, uh, the treatment must be proper. Uh, then uh, there should not be any pathogens in it. And uh, particularly, he's talking about fecal sludge management treatment. It's altogether different if we talk about the UDDTs. Uh, as I already said that UDDTs are ready to give you the soil conditioner at the end of the 12 months. So, but then for FSM, it is properly treated. Uh, it can be co-treatment uh, in the con uh, conventional treatment plant or there, that there can be standalone fecal sludge uh, treatment plants, but uh, regulations uh, with respect to reuse are not uh, there unless, uh, unless and until you uh, treat it properly. Okay, uh, thank you very much um, for the interesting quick discussion. The next speaker that we have for today is Alexander Wolf from Boda. Um, Alexander holds a doctorate in marine ecology and he has extensive uh, research and consultancy experience in the sectors of natural resource management, marine ecosystems and ecosystem-based strategies for climate change. 
Um, Alex, we look forward to hearing your talk. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Madora. <clears throat> Can you all hear me? Yes, or not? Madora, do you hear me? Yes, yes, it's visible and I can hear you perfectly. Please go on. Okay. Um, so one second. So, Christopher, you're sharing your screen, right? Is that correct? I did already. Hmm? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so first, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Christo, for inviting Borda as local NGO from Bremen to join the seminar. And a warm welcome to all of you. I see at least two familiar faces, Mr. Raymond Meyer from Umweltbetriebe Bremen and a dear colleague from India, Mrs. Mita Sina. Hello to you. So after um, Dr. Panzin provided a nice overview of the details of what a value can be created from urine and feces, I would try to point out the value of water in the urban context in big cities. Um, <clears throat> as Madura said, my name is um, Alex Wolf and I work for Borda as a regional coordinator for the South Asia region. So to start with, Borda has been founded in 1977 stands for the Bremen Research Overseas Research and Development Association. And um, we develop decentralized basic needs services and provide these services on municipal level. And our focus is clearly on the water and sanitation sector. So we try to um, provide these services to disadvantaged um, groups. But by doing this, we also would like to create livable spaces and protect natural resources as they occur. And as we are an NGO, our guiding principles relate to, especially to the human rights, to water, but also include participatory um, practices, water stewardship if it comes to large areas that need to be um, governed, and also partly the water and energy food uh, nexus. How are we doing this? We are trying to capacitate um, in the regions by tra <clears throat> transferring know-how and also technologies to some extent, and also by advising sector policies. Okay. <clears throat> in the next slide, you would see um, the regions we are working in. So basically, what is working in five regions. So we do have Latin America, um, <clears throat> depicted here in green, the African region by uh, divided into Western Africa and the Eastern and Southern area. The blue dot up there is the administrative hub, hub Bremen. And then towards the East, we do have Western and Central Asia, South Asia and Southeast Asia. And all of these regions do have regional offices from which we steer and govern the activities in these regions. As I said, our focus is on decentralized systems. And just to give you one number, um, there have been about three and a half thousand systems for water and sanitation that have been implemented over time in our regions. Next slide, please. Um, just a brief overview on the donors and the cooperation partners that we have. So being a a German and a Bremen NGO, of course, we do cooperate and rely on the Department of Economic Development Cooperation from the state of Bremen, but also um, we cooperate with Hans and Wasser Lamotte, for example, and the University of Bremen. If we look at Germany, um, our most important donor has been the uh, Ministry for Economic um, Cooperation and Development, the BMZ, but also other ministries like the BNBF or the GIZ um, are relevant partners for us. We also engage in networks such as the WASH network and um, Venro, and again, cooperate with universities like Hafen City University Hamburg, Technical University Berlin, 
but also Viva from Aqua, for example. If we look at Europe, we um, received from funds from the European Commission, um, had a good uh, network, including Airwork, Swiss uh, academic, academic Institution, Stockholm Environmental Institute, but also um, development um, banks such as the Swiss Development Corporation, um, the UK equivalent DIVID, but also Oxfam Alliance Club, for example. Internationally, it is very broad, can be UN agencies, development banks, but also um, foundations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So that should just give you a short overview on how uh, we are embedded. Um, as an NGO focusing on water, and this mostly in an urban context, um, there are two SDGs which are really very high on our, um, let's say, agenda. So one is SDG number six, ensuring access to water and sanitation. Just to remind you of who expects out of that. So by 2030, we ought to achieve universal and equitable access to uh, drinking water and at the same time achieve access to adequate and equitable sanitation and hygiene for all and to end open defecation. So that uh, sets the goal pretty high already. And how do we do this? You put the next slide. As we're working in the, um, a lot in the urban context, of course, SDG number 11, making cities and human settlements inclusive resilient and sustainable um, dire is directly impacted um, or is directly related to when working with water. So having the goal of um, sustainable urbanization um, and reducing the uh, environmental impact of cities um, is uh, basically two of the, the primary goals we would like to contribute to. Um, in today's talk, I will focus on the South Asian region. And as some of our regions do differ a bit in, in focus here, just for your, let's say, overview, again, that our focus in the South Asian region is on sanitation, on wastewater, but also um, directly directly related to that solid waste management. And as such, um, the impact on public health is evident. How are we doing this? We are basically, as a consequence, um, also influ influence water-wise, let's say urban design and the livability of, of spaces. And we're doing this by engaging with municipalities and local governments. So, um, I tried to formulate three points which um, we can consider when talking about nature-based solutions or about urbanization. So one is many Indian cities still have high rates of non-existing or non-functioning or substandard water and sanitation service delivery, especially to disadvantaged citizens. So this can be seen as a, as a look on individual level. Secondly, um, cities and or, or mega cities still or did have, do have traditional water sources, which were available and are still existing, but these are deteriorating very often due to unthoughtful urban development. And as a third point, becoming or getting bigger in, in scale, let's say. Many of these cities do have large urban water bodies, which also continue to degrade rather than are they used and integrated into urban or urbanization in a sustainable way. So, um, in the next slide, I took this from a uh, another project of ours, which is related with the, um, how to include different sectors in, the, um, in urban development. It's not that we go through the details of all of those, but it shows very nicely how the ecology 
um, of a city that exists um, changes with increasing um, urbanization. So starting from a completely natural ground or soil um, towards a high in, in the lower left side to the most um, dense um, scenario in highly um, well, in, in large cities, you see that three factors change um, uh, in a certain way. So one, the evo trans transpiration is reduced with increasing um, building or density. Then the infiltration capacity of the soil is entirely, or not entirely, but strongly inhibited. So the more um, surfaces are sealed off, the less water can um, get into the soil. And as a consequence, the runoff, so basically the water that is lost, um, increases from only 10% in a natural environment up to 55%, or at least it's increasing uh, dramatically in very dense areas. So if we now take these two drivers of climate change and of urbanization, we realize that those put enormous pressure on water resources and really question how urban infrastructure is still currently built and whether we need to change our, our mindset for that. Um, well, there are plenty of examples. We know them from, from the news all over, but also last or a few months ago, the heavy rainfalls uh, in Western Germany caused flooding in areas which were sealed um, causing enormous damage and um, death of, of humans. So as Borders focus is playing very much on water, how, so the question is how, how does sustainable urban development and water fit together? So basically they are inseparable. And looking from the other way around, water can contribute in a very fundamental way to sustainable urban development on very different levels. So in the next slide, I simply wanted to point out um, what kind of waters exist in a city. So we do have service, surface waters, we do have drinking water, waste water, um, storm water, and adding to that also, of course, solid waste. And that means that we are required to think water in a very holistic way. There are many different approaches for that. Um, just one, one keyword is integrated water resource management. But I think the uh, crucial point is that natural water systems, especially when they are existing like rivers going through cities or lakes uh, need to be integrated um, into urbanization in a way more um, beneficial way especially in the Indian context where water scarcity is becoming a real threat already, uh, the reusing, uh, reuse of water is even more critical. So in the next slide, I took a definition of what nature-based solutions mean. And they can mean very different things for different people. And also uh, they differ very much in scale. So the definition is that Nature-based solutions are defined as actions to protect, manage, and restore ecosystems that address societal changes effectively, providing human well-being and biodiversity benefits. And uh, nature-based systems exist in various for various kinds. So they can can mean restoring, protecting forests or wetlands bringing uh, or coastal habitats, but also bringing nature into cities. Um, and I would like to show three examples how water's work is taking up, um, thank you, is taking up the principle of nature-based solutions and um, by that improve the, or well, contribute to, to sustainable urbanization. So one is, let's, I, I called it urban micro scale. And what does it mean? It means that, um, as Dr. Panzer already pointed out, there are different ways of treating wastewater. 
And uh, when we look at individual or on household level, or let's say on, um, can also be a hospital or a slaughterhouse or a building block, each of those entities need or produce wastewater or polluted waters, uh, which requires treatment. And nature-based solutions would mean that there are ways how these polluted waters are treated and um, water <laughs> implemented since 30 years plus, so-called DWATS systems. Here you see uh, just a schematic of those different um, modules, but it basically comes down to the fact that it's a microbiological treatment that um, treats the wastewater to an extent that it is much more suitable to be released into the um, environment. Um, and this is a key, let's say, treatment module, which is applicable to many areas which do not, um, which are not included in centralized sewage systems, which is the case in many cities around the world. So, um, by having these kind of systems, we do not only support the well-being of the humans in order to, so sicknesses are prevented because they're not exposed that much to um, wastewater anymore, but we also pro improve the livability in cities if, if there is no open um, polluted waters running through the city, especially in times of flooding or heavy rainfall. And second um, direct impact is on the environment um, to ensure the future use of, let's say, groundwater or aquifers that are um, very crucial for many cities. So even though the, the system as such can be considered gray infrastructure because it's built, of course, can be concrete, can be um, prefabricated with um, um, what you see in the next picture, but the idea of having a microbiological treatment as such in it um, makes it a, a truly nature-based solution, which is running without electricity. Okay. And the next picture, you see how that would look if um, done properly. So this is not a picture from South Asia, but from Latin America. And it's a system where you, on the right-hand side, you see um, planted gravel filter in which the wastewater was uh, directed after treatment and the treated water at the end can be used for irrigation or growing crops, for example. Now, the second um, example I'd like to shortly refer to is not on an individual level, but on the urban, uh, let's say in the urban scale, a bit larger. Um, yeah, I relate to the work done in Nepal and it's part of Borders, let's say, integrated water research, uh, water uh, resource management efforts. Nepal has many traditional and also man-made water points, so-called water spouts. These are extractions point, extraction points for water. And the local population relies heavily on those for drinking water needs. So with increasing, um, excuse me, with increasing pollution and drying up of water sources, those are critical for um, having water in, in the city. Also, these spouts of cultural, cultural value for the community. And it has been Borders efforts to restore those water sprouts and to, pro or to provide appropriate protection, which you see in the next, next picture. picture. Um, Another example is in Northern India in the city of Leh, which is also, where also a river is running very close by and providing um, most of the water for, for the in inhabitants. And as over time, in many, as in many cases, the direction and the flow of the river has been adapted, has been increased and pollution has taken its toll on the water quality. Every time um, strong uh, rainfall is coming, this 
this water source becomes rather a threat than of use to, to the inhabitants. So Borders work has been to, together with the municipality, see where um, or how this water source or the river as such can be improved, let's say by different um, storage places or um, the water sprouts uh, protected. So the further use of these um, water sources can be guaranteed. Okay. Now, the last example I would like to show is really on the, the largest scale. Um, as I said, in many cities, large water bodies exist. And um, what you see here is from a very nice publication by one of our most important and experienced partners in South, in South Asia by CDD Society. So if you go on their website, you will also see plenty of um, publications concerned with water body rejuvenation. And here on this map, you see where the Indian government has taken up um, lake rejuvenation projects where um, also CDD has been involved. And I'd like to refer to or show a few pictures of one specific rejuvenation project that took place in Bangalore. And Bangalore has been known as the city of lakes. And interestingly, many of these lakes have been uh, man-made quite some um, centuries ago for drinking water, irrigation and fishing needs. And they have been interlinked um, very smartly um, to prevent wastage of water. Now, um, as we all know, due to increased water supply um, and water usage, these lakes have strongly decreased over time. And on top of that, the majority of these lakes um, is highly polluted due to the untreated sewage flowing into them. So um, one example, Mahadevapura Lake, in, in Bangalore has been, um, has completely dried up and became a natural sewage deposition site uh, due to urban development. And it was only due to, reach, to efforts by the government, by corporates around and communities and national and international NGOs that this lake has been restored or being brought back on track to really serve as much more than just a water body, but also has recreational um, value, for example. And on the next picture, you see technically what um, CDD has done, or either done or also um, suggests for any other similar project when it comes to lake rejuvenation. So this goes, um, for example, um, of course, de-weeding if the eutrophication caused an entire overgrow of, of the uh, lake itself, but also certain catchment interventions, stormwater drains, um, um, a check of inflow to the lake and certain outflows where needed to, to um, balance the, the water quantity. And of course, also pollution reduction. And that means either construction of toilets, yes, but also awareness campaigns when it comes to solid waste um, pollution and especially, um, specifically wastewater treatment, of course. And here you see two pictures um, that has been taken, um, obviously, when the lake has been pretty much dried up. I'm not sure whether you can uh, read the uh, numbers here. But um, if you look at the link, I guess the presentation will be provided afterwards. If you look at the link, you will see all these details for this project. And in the next picture, you see um, that the lake has been, well, restored in <laughs> quite an impressive way. And one major impact certainly had the installation of a large uh, wastewater treatment system based on the principles that I showed before. Okay, well, we're in time a bit. Um, that's it from my side. 
I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Madura. So maybe just let's wait for a couple of minutes to see if there are any questions. I don't have any immediate questions for you. Maybe you can go ahead with something. Yeah, many thanks to you, Alexander. And um, I think that was again very impressive and uh, particularly the last two pictures which showed uh, what uh, yeah, difference it makes if you install um, suitable um, yeah, wastewater treatment systems and what you can reach with that. I think that was really uh, very obvious seen at the Madhavatura Lake in uh, Bangalore. Yeah, are there any direct questions to um, Alexander? Yeah. Was it a question or just some noise? <laughs> Um, yeah, perhaps to start in, in a discussion, I think, um, yeah, here is from Fabio. Um, I don't know, that's a personal message. So, but um, I have a question perhaps directed firstly to Diane and um, how important is uh, let's say cooperation between state institutions and uh, civil society. I think um, generally we are talking about something which should have been perhaps mainly a state responsibility to take care that all um, the, the whole population has um, suitable uh, access to clear water and sanitation. But I think uh, um, civil society organizations are also needed in that process. How would you describe that uh, connection? Well, basically, as you rightly said, uh, the state government are responsible to provide these uh, water and sanitation facilities to all. But then uh, the fact is that they cannot reach to each and every person on the ground level. Uh, that is where the role of civil societies or the NGOs is very much important since the uh, NGOs are working with the people and they know the needs of the people, uh, be it uh, urban area, be it uh, rural area. If we take, for example, the urban area slums, there are many organizations, we call it as community-based organizations or uh, other grassroots organizations, they work with the people and then they try to link that gap, which is required for the state functionaries, state machineries to effectively deliver their uh, facilities uh, goal to the masses. So, uh, so the word itself, it describes we, government organization, GEO or NGOs, non-governmental organizations. So both in hand in hand together, they are required and that is why uh, it is interdependence of the government organizations on civil societies or the NGOs. Yeah, I mean, here, I, as I can see many people from NGOs or from institutions who are working in the sanitation sector, you are really invited to contribute or to to comment or to ask? So if I may add, this is Sujaya. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Sujaya. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Fancy. Uh, yeah, good to hear. And uh, this is another uh, um, passion, uh, subject that I'm passionate about is sanitation. Uh, so I just wanted to add to Dr. Fancy that also the capacity of the government is also not, is very limited. And the new paradigms that are 
needed for a transformation in the urbanization in the urban development in different uh, uh, different domains and aspects i think that comes from you know the the out of the government or i would say non government organizations which have the capacity working with the government they build the internal capacity and they work together uh, to uh, to get you know the ad the advocacy starts with them and then the uh, and then you know what dr fanse has done i think through ecosan foundation is first to advocate the the whole concept and the uh, of of ecosan of ecosanitation and then bring in the capacity the technology the technical know how and that's how i think uh, it is going even uh, cdd society with their divots and uh, borda and cdd society with, uh, they are now working together with the uh, government of india bringing you know fecal sludge treatment plants etc which uh, and showing by doing that this is possible and then transferring the capacity to to others and and spreading it all over i think that is uh, one of the ways that uh, and a very important role that the ngos play uh, in, in in the indian context Yeah, uh, thanks, Riya. Thank yeah. Other comments on that? I think we have a question from Tamil, or probably just unmuted I, himself. I, think, uh, I, I would also uh, request Sushmita to say uh, or express yourself, Sushmita. You have vast experience. Was it a direct question to Susmita? Direct. Okay. Meanwhile, I think Amrita Swiss has shared a link um, in the chat box about the Jal Jeevan Mission, which is another way of uh, connecting the government bodies with the local people. Yeah. So. I mean, if we have a look at this sanitation situation in the global south, I think it reminds me partly to the situation in regarding climate change. So in a certain way, everything is known what we have to do, but we, we don't have to do it. <laughs> yeah, but, but we don't do it or it's not done yeah. enough. So um, I think it's also. But what was it? What my question is: What what is the, the 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 main reason for that? Is it the lack of resources, or the lack of political will, or, for example, is there still scientific research needed? Well, it is a very complicated uh, situation. I would say, it's not that lack of resources or lack of political will. However, uh, I would say it is uh, approach towards the problem, and uh, the urbanization is happening very rampantly. It is unplanned growth, and sometimes uh, in in the cities here in India, the cities are growing first, and then infrastructure comes later on. That's the basic issue. That and then government keeps on providing the facilities. but however cities are expanding continuously by 2030 there will be more than 50 cities which has a population of 1 million plus in india and i think europe has not more than 50 or rather 50 cities as of today even so you can think coming to the resources the overall water availability of india is continuously depleting uh, 50 years back or 60 years back uh, we had 2500 or 2600 cubic meter of water per person per year available now it is coming down to less than 1500 or 1400 so slowly india could be marching towards water stress or water scarce country and then uh, the conventional systems are water centric systems so it's a continuous race between the uh, population as well as the providing the facilities 
and somehow yes government is doing but then we normally say that business as usual is not enough we have to think something differently and out of the box solutions are not good enough so that is how it is happening so sector professionals are always challenged with the situation and the new technologies are required new philosophical approaches are, approaches are required so that that's that's the thing so i i actually found it very interesting that there was a nice contrast in the rural context and urban context between the two talks so i actually uh, had a question to alex um, and so um you focused mainly on the urban context uh, in most of your talk but i was just interested to know if there are uh, any initiatives of boda and cdd with respect to uh, any projects implemented in the rural context and how would you uh, try to differ in the implementation process there <clears throat> um when we think of the bm set funded projects that we were doing over the last years we also um, go along with their priorities and um, it's a question of where to um, create the biggest leverage for example and therefore the um, or where most most um, beneficiaries can be reached of course this is also possible for a rural context but in the urban context it seems that um, well the leverage seems to be bigger especially also in india that many many people really move towards the cities and and in our current uh, regional program for south asia we do focus on smaller cities small in the indian context still means um, quite a lot of people but um yeah this is where and i think it's it's um understandable keeping the focus on let's say peri urban at most or urban context is um, is appropriate so currently we do not have any activities really focusing on rural areas okay. okay can i add something to that of course Yeah. yeah so uh, i also uh, am you know sort of uh, work with cdd society intermittently and uh, right now they're doing uh, a rural they did some sort of rural uh, sanitation work in karnataka and they have taken that learning to west bengal uh, and uh, the approach that they are following is on a uh, cluster based approach where if there is an ex existing you know uh, sanitation facility uh, if and there's capacity they are trying to uh, see clusters of uh, uh, panchayats or, or, or rural you know uh, rural areas which can sort of feed into that their uh, sludge or uh, and then if that is not a possibility then they are immediately also they are saying that let us do a very safe disposal immediately and that's about trenching just trenching is what they are doing uh, as as a as a you know state wide approach but that is a very short term and then uh, uh if there is co treatment available they do a co that's another option and if nothing of these are you know possible then they would go for a, a standalone fstp and they are trying to pilot one uh near uh, near calcutta uh, i think uh, somewhere uh, in the rural peri urban you know that sort of a uh it's all sort of it's a very gray area i would say that's where they are trying to pilot uh in uh, and uh, that's where it is and a lot of capacity building because this is a new concept for them and so uh, we've done a little bit of capacity building and some uh, some more capacity building will be done going forward uh, this month or uh, next month uh building in 
more of the capacity of uh, you know uh, of maintenance operation maintenance uh, standard operating uh, protocols those very you know hand holding them in the nitty gritties of those uh, is one of the approach that they were doing for west bengal sushmita if you can add and i sorry uh, i couldn't respond earlier uh, uh, so i had got a call at that just at that time so i couldn't respond uh, so uh, taking the question that you had asked about you know why things are not working effectively or not, not as much as we would want it to in india one of the reasons i would say is that you know a uh, policies or sanitation related policies programs are all made at the center the national government and then the states and cities are directed to follow it uh, but when they go to follow it at a practical level they realize that you know many of the directives or guidelines are not implementable at the city level or town level so i think uh, we this bottom up approach has to be adopted we talk about the nirmal toilet program some years ago and uh, you know where rural sanitation worked effectively but we for kind of forgot about it again and i think uh, all policies and um, uh, the missions that are being um, uh, rolled out in the country if it was actually developed or contextualized for the state for the towns and cities and then Uh, you know it fed into the national policy that approach perhaps would be more if to transfer the uh, solution rather than keeping it just at a policy level or in a document so i think uh uh ji uh, said very uh, directly that the approaches that we adopt to or, you know we don't to uh, uh project uh, approach perhaps if we revise and things would be more and we more as me that the feeling there's a bad line in the moment um so we can't hear you properly yeah i yeah. think there's a connection issue yeah okay but i think we we got the main message and um, yeah thanks for this um, very interesting contributions to the discussion and uh, dr panze mentioned already one keyword he uh, talked about the unplanned uh, developing of the big cities and i think that leads us already to the next session mm -hmm. but be, before we come to the next session we have one point immediate uh, in between that's our break so let's meet again in 10 minutes um, in german time it's quarter past 11 and in uh, indian time it's a uh, quarter to four, and then yeah. we can continue with our session uh, on mobility hmm?